morning, everyone. Um, Congressman Lowenthal here, and I'm going to call the Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources to order. Uh, depending upon your time zone, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. This subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on efforts to expand clean energy on public lands and H.R. 3326, uh, the Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act of 2021, introduced by Representative Levin. Under rule, committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings will be limited to the chair and the ranking member um, or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and to keep members and to help members keep to their schedule. Therefore, I'm going to ask unanimous consent that all members opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or at the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Without objection also, the chair may declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as with in-person meetings, members are responsible for their own microphones. Members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical difficulties should inform the committee staff immediately. Our nation's public lands and waters are often ideal locations for wind, solar, and geothermal energy projects. And now, thanks to the leadership of Secretary Holland and President Biden, it's a new day for clean energy on public lands. Since coming into office, the Biden administration has made it clear that addressing the climate crisis is imperative to preserving the safety and security of our nation. But it's also an opportunity to create good paying, family sustaining jobs, address historic inequities in our nation's energy infrastructure, and to restore U.S global leadership. H.R. 3326, the Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act, will help achieve these shared goals in a way that is balanced, responsible, and respects input from local communities. Building clean energy projects will also create jobs, especially in rural communities across the West. According to one recent estimate, Wind and solar projects in rural communities in the United States are expected to support around 40,000 construction jobs and provide $2.3 billion in annual wages by 2030. These same projects will also create 38,000 jobs in long-term operations and maintenance adding another $3.7 billion in expected annual wages over the coming decade. Today's hearing is an opportunity to hear from experts on how we can responsibly jumpstart wind, solar, and geothermal on public lands. We'll also hear from the Bureau of Land Management on how they are using their new authorities that became law at the end of last year, thanks to bipartisan work by this subcommittee. Turning to the subject of bipartisanship, I want to remind members that our witnesses have been generous in their times in preparing for today's hearings in, in accordance with the hearing notice. We should do our best to hear the te their testimony in a timely manner and give them the opportunity to respond to our questions. Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act has a long history 
of bipartisanship in both the House and the Senate. And we've had several successful bipartisan hearings over the years in this sub, on this subcommittee, and I hope that tradition will continue today. And additionally, in closing, additionally, I do support Mr. Levin's work on this bill. He has been clear from the start how we can best work together to pass a bill through the House and get it signed into law. But however, there's no denying there's an ongoing lack of trust and heightened partisanship following the events of January 6th. But Representative Levin has provided all members of this committee with a with what he believes is a workable bipartisan path forward to give Florida a good chance of becoming law. I will, however, commit that since there is another bill that has been introduced to holding a hearing on Mr. Gosar's version of the Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act. However, I do plan to co-sponsor H.R. 33 26 in the, coming, in the coming days, I'm going to encourage all my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do the same. I think I have some time remaining, which I'd like to now yield to Representative Levin. Well, thank you, Chair Lowenthal, for your, yielding me some time. As, as my colleagues are aware, I introduced Plurita to Congress without any original co-sponsors. I was proud that this bill was introduced with bipartisan support last Congress, and I expect it will continue to have bipartisan support. I worked with members of both parties on a wide range of issues during my time in Congress, and I'm proud to have gotten bills signed into law with colleagues across the ideological spectrum. And that, in fact, is my top priority with this bill as well. In fact, my only uh, goal with this bill is to get it signed into law. And as I explained to Mr. Gosar uh, in a conversation we had on the floor, having his name at the top could be detrimental to that goal. But I invited him to co-sponsor the bill after introduction, and that invite still stands. I'm proud of the bill we have today. I'm proud of the language that we crafted, and I'm proud that this remains an effort uh, that should be bipartisan, certainly capable of bipartisan support. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Levin. I now recognize Ranking Member Stauber for his opening statement. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, for yielding. And thank you, Ms. for joining us today. Uh, I will just remind uh, Mr. Chair, you and I spoke earlier, um, I will be in and out as the ranker, and so Representative Gosar will be filling in uh, when I can't. Today, the Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources had a rare opportunity for true bipartisanship as we listened to testimony on the Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act, an idea created and developed for the better part of a decade by my friend and member of this subcommittee, Paul Gosar. This bill lends a touch of common sense to our burdensome permitting process. America has the best and brightest developing projects in the world, and the permitting process is, is an important component. However, everybody here knows that the process gets hijacked by activist lawyers seeking to make a buck. If it takes a year and a half longer to build a highway or a solar project, the lawyers get paid a year and a half more billable hours. Permitting reform is needed, and the remaining provisions from the Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act that were not included in last year's energy omnibus are a great first start. Therefore, Representative Gosar's language before us today is a great opportunity for a strong bipartisan message on getting energy projects completed on federal lands. Yet, my fellow Democrats still found a way to set a disturbing precedent. These last five months have admittedly seen very little bipartisanship, especially in the energy and minerals world. Democrats started their Green New Deal agenda by killing union jobs on the Keystone XL pipeline and 124 days later, supporting a Russian pipeline with Russian workers. Democrats on this panel defended the president's agenda by carrying the Green New Deal agenda forward with banning onshore oil and gas leasing, pushing a vague and undefined plan to lock up America's lands and waters, banning offshore oil development, killing mining projects that have committed to union labor and others. 
Republicans, meanwhile, have defended responsible energy development, high wage and family sustaining jobs and revenues to communities that need it the most in rural areas. Regardless of the, wi the wide gulf between Republicans and Democrats here, we know there's room for bipartisanship. The Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act was at the top of the list. Therefore, we should surely, we could have a strong, we thought surely we could have a strong bipartisan hearing on legislation developed on this panel by a former subcommittee chair. We need bipartisanship in this forum. Instead, last week, Democrats on this panel strong armed my friend, Mr. Gosar, and introduced his bill he developed and invested time and effort into for many years. The precedent set is disturbing and it fits a pattern the Democratic Party in power has set. At the executive level, an unprecedented number of executive orders, many of which are just taglines from activists. In the Senate, threats to eliminate the filibuster. In the House, gutting the motion to recommit and stripping out agreed upon amendments before floor consideration. At the committee level, hearings being held virtually in complete denial of current CDC guidance. Now at the subcommittee level, taking ideas from members across the aisle because you simply disagree with their right to cast a vote on the House floor. So here we are. While I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on the merits of Representative Goldsauer's plural language in the vehicle before us, this, this would be bipartisan hearing once again, but must illustrate the gulf between Republicans and Democrats on energy and mineral resources. Before I close, I respectfully ask each and every Democrat here to reflect on the precedent being set and what that could mean should things look different two years from now. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Uh, I now recognize our full committee chair, Representative Rahalva. Chair Rahalva, welcome to the subcommittee. You are recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Lowenthal, for holding this hearing. And, and thanks to uh, Representative Levin for introducing HR 3326. Uh, I want to thank the, the Congressman for uh, Levin for his comments and all the work on the bill because it is an important topic and we're benefiting from his leadership and your leadership, Mr. Chairman, uh, in moving this, this important legislation, bipartisan legislation that began uh, on this committee in 2011 and 2000, uh, the 111th and 112th Congress. Um, I was on the committee. And uh, the, at that time, it was Mr. Heck and Mr. Heinrich. And as it progressed in the 115th, 116th, it got action. And uh, finally, after all those years, and uh, and was moved forward. It, was, it has yet to be a standalone piece of legislation. And, and, and if that is uh, the next necessary step, then, then I think we should take it. And I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing. Uh, you know the uh, the the, uh, the the ominous thought <laughs> and statement that you know things could change, and if, we, if the, the precedent being set here, things could change with the change of a majority. Yeah. Things always change with the change of, of a majority, and and I I uh, I think that what is, but I would I guarantee you that if uh, my party found itself in the minority, uh, which it won't. Uh, then, then, uh, then I could guarantee you that none of us, none of us, uh, would be involved in organizing, in promoting a big lie, and in uh, in promoting and and working with an effort uh, to uh, halt uh, the work of Congress on January sixth, an effort that turned violent, turned ugly. And the consequences are still before us. Um, there's been a lot of mis misinformation out there today about the hear this hearing and about this bill. A Republican colleague introduced a bill with identical language, so we know there that we agree uh, uh, that we all agree on the policy. Um, but you know, it's it's important to note the attack on the Capitol was a threat to our democracy. The ongoing refusal to accept the results of the presidential election is a threat to our democracy. 
the on ongoing efforts to overturn valid election results in my home state of Arizona is a threat to the democracy. The refusal of many of my Republican colleagues to support a bipartisan commission to understand what happened January 6th, as we had with the 9-11 commission, is disappointing. And any whitewashing attempts to recast what all of us saw, heard, and felt on January 6th in the Capitol uh, is uh, as something that was no big deal. Well, democracy is a big deal. And I hope we could, we continue to, and I will work to continue to, uh, for us together in both parties to investigate and stop any threats in our democracy. Mr. Levin has made it clear that every single member of this body is welcome to co-sponsor his bill, and I intend to do that. He is working to get uh, it passed through Congress and over to the president's desk to become law. Nothing we've heard today changes any of that. So once again, I want to thank Chair Lowenthal for giving me this opportunity to speak and to and for his efforts to proceed with this subcommittee's legislative work in an orderly and civil way. And Representative Levin for his work on, on this bipartisan proposal. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Chair Grijalva. Uh, I Mr. now Chairman, recognize- Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Congressman Tiffany. Yes. Um, at the end of last meeting, Myself and Representative Harrell were denied the ability to question witnesses. And as a result of that denial, I would like to share some comments on that. Will you allow me to do that? Yes, yes, I will allow you. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman, for giving me the latitude to share a few comments because it was very disturbing uh, at our last meeting that Representative Harrell and I we juggled our schedule, voting on the floor of the House to be able to being very mindful that we needed to be in committee to be able to ask questions of the witnesses. We were denied the ability to do that when the uh, committee was gaveled out without us being recognized. And both of us are extremely disappointed in that because we do not vote proxy. We believe it is unconstitutional to vote proxy, and we understand many of you do, but we take our solemn duty to um, walk to the floor of the House of Representatives and cast our vote very seriously, and that's what we wanted to do. But we're seeing the same old thing in this committee. We see technical glitches. We see people not on mute talking, interrupting people that are speaking, and now we get this where we're not even allowed to be able to question witnesses that come before this committee. This committee has been, I believe, quite dysfunctional since the start of this session. This is the first time that I've served on it, but I just remember my days in the Wisconsin legislature. Things like this did not happen. We were able to conduct committee hearings, including on very contentious issues, without the enormous problems that have, um, that have hampered this committee from being able to do its job. The other thing I would say, Mr. Chairman, there was one question in particular I wanted to ask the uh, county supervisor from San Diego County. She talked about externalities of, um, of fossil fuel production. I wanted to ask her about the externalities of what she was calling for, which is so-called green energy with wind and solar, because we're seeing landfills that will not take wind turbines because of the toxic minerals that are in them. I wanted to ask her about the externalities, those secondary costs, those downstream costs, you know, uh, especially of disposal of things uh, like wind and solar. And I think with what we're debating today, that is equally as important. And we see the impact now with what happened with the Colonial Pipeline being shut down, three quarters of the gasoline stations in North Carolina did not have gasoline a couple weekends ago. We see a neighboring governor to Wisconsin here, the governor of Michigan, that's calling for the shutdown of the Enbridge pipeline. Nearly a third of my constituents use propane to heat their homes here in northern Wisconsin. Shutting down that pipeline would jeopardize them being able to get uh, to be able to heat their homes and to be able to drive their cars. And yet we have a governor that is threatening the upper Midwestern states, and it is the upper Midwestern states as well as 
uh, Canada in Ontario that is threatened by this. And instead, we're talking about this so-called green energy that's going to do such a great job for us. Well, we've seen the leading edge of green energy, and it is what happened with the Colonial Pipeline and what is being proposed by the governor of Michigan. So I believe in an all of the above um, energy policy. But what we keep seeing from this committee is we exclude certain types of energy, in particular fossil fuels, to the detriment of people, especially low-income people, who are going to bear the costs of these higher prices for, uh, to be able to turn on their lights and to be able to drive their cars. But I just want to close by saying, I understand a lot of you representatives from California have had the luxury of being able to vote proxy from out in your homes in California. But you know what? There's a lot of us that believe that there's our constitutional duty. In fact, it says in the Constitution that we shall be in the United States Capitol in order to uh, cast our votes and conduct our work. And it's time for this committee to respect that. It's time for this committee to get us back into session in person. Even the Judiciary Committee I sit in, the, the chairman has us there in session, allows us to take our masks off. This committee is not doing that, and it is to the detriment of the work that we were all hired to do by the people that we represent. This has been very disappointing the first five months of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank, thank you, Representative Tiffany. I now recognize the full committee ranking member, Mr. Westerman, for an opening statement. Is Mr. Westerman there? I am not hearing Mr. Westerman. I'll wait one more time and then we'll have later on when Mr. Westerman returns, we will give him, certainly give him an opportunity to make a statement at that point. Um, if not, let's go on to, uh, 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 well, first I wanna thank all the members for their, for their statements, uh, for their opening statements. We're gonna go to panel number one now. Um, and I'm happy to welcome our first witness. Uh, that's uh, Nada Culver from the Bureau of Land Management. Ms. Culver serves as the Deputy Director of BLM and is also exercising the authority of the Director. Ms. Culver, welcome back to the committee in this new role. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, members of the subcommittee and the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the development of renewable energy on public lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management and on the Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act. I am Nada Wolf Culver. I'm the BLM's Deputy Director for Policy and Programs. This July, we'll celebrate the 75th anniversary of the BLM. Over the years, the BLM has evolved and adapted its mission to meet the needs of our nation and serve as a steward of our public lands and resources. As we look forward to celebrating this milestone, we recognize BLM managed lands provide an opportunity to address some of the nation's most pressing challenges, including those related to climate change and transitioning to a clean energy economy. The BLM manages approximately 245 million surface acres located primarily in 12 Western states and mineral resources across 700 million subsurface acres. Under our multiple use and sustainable mandate directed by Congress, the BLM manages public lands for a broad range of uses, including renewable and conventional energy development, as well as livestock grazing, timber production, hunting and fishing, recreation and conservation, including protection of cultural and historic resources. In our initial efforts to achieve, oops, sorry. <laughs> BLM will continue to carry out this mandate while supporting the administration's goals to increase renewable energy development on public land. President Biden issued Executive Order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad to restore balance on public lands and waters, create jobs, and provide a path to align the management of America's public lands and waters with our nation's climate conservation and clean energy goals. 
The order sets ambitious goals that will ensure America can meet the urgent demands of the climate crisis and directs the Secretary of the Interior to identify ways we can increase renewable energy production on public lands. To meet these goals, the BLM is taking a variety of actions to expand clean energy development on public lands, including solar, wind, and geothermal projects. Through the Solar Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement, we designated 285,000 acres of solar energy zones and identified another approximately 19 million acres of public lands with solar energy potential in California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. The BLM also identified more than 20 million acres of BLM managed public lands with wind energy potential in 11 Western states and has the authority to manage geothermal leasing on hundreds of millions of acres of federal mineral estate as allowed under applicable land use plans. In 2016, we finalized the competitive leasing rule and the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan in California. In our initial efforts to achieve the president's renewable energy goals, as well as those outlined in the Energy Act of 2020, we developed a proposal to establish renewable energy coordination offices, and we're working on an interagency memorandum of understanding to enhance permitting coordination. We're prioritizing a short list of key programmatic actions, regulation updates, and interim policies. This includes updating areas of focus for solar, wind, and geothermal development, as well as designation of energy corridors for pipelines and power lines, and undertaking a rulemaking to comprehensively address rental rates and fees. On May 3rd of this year, the BLM approved the Crimson Solar Project in the California desert, which has the potential to deliver enough electricity to power approximately 87,500 homes. The BLM is also unlocking new opportunities for renewable energy through large scale bulk electricity transmission projects, including GreenLink West and GreenLink North in Nevada and the 10 West Link in Arizona. Permitted renewable energy projects on BLM managed lands include 36 wind projects, 37 solar projects, and 47 operating power plants developing geothermal energy with a collective total of more than 12,400 megawatts of capacity. The BLM anticipates permitting up to 3,000 additional megawatts of renewable energy this fiscal year and is currently evaluating dozens of other renewable energy projects. The Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act seeks to promote and expedite the development of solar, wind, and geothermal energy projects on federal lands. The BLM recognizes the importance of identifying low conflict priority areas and appreciates the attention to financial certainty for grant holders provided by the bill. This legislation aligns with the administration's goal of promoting renewable energy development and we support it. The BLM looks forward to continuing to work with the committee and the Congress on these important issues. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Colbert, um, for that testimony. I want to remind members of the committee that Committee Rule 3D imposes a five-minute limit on questions, and the chair is now going to recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask witnesses. I recognize Representative Levin for five minutes of questions. Well, thank you again, Chairman Lowenthal, for holding this hearing today, and I want to uh, try to focus uh, back on the bipartisan legislation at hand. Uh, as uh, has been said, my colleagues chose to introduce the exact same legislation as I did, and I think that shows we still agree on the policy and uh, need to be working together in a way that gives it the best chance possible to be signed into law. Uh, we need to get this bill signed into law because clean energy generation is the future. The Biden administration has committed that future by setting the goal to achieve 100% carbon pollution-free power on our grid by 2035. Our public lands can and should be part of that. And Florida, along with the provisions of the bill that became law last year, will ensure that responsible renewable development takes place on our federal lands. As my colleagues have highlighted, Florida would direct the Bureau of Land Management to establish priority areas for solar, wind, and geothermal development on federal lands. These are areas where development would not conflict with other important uses like conservation and recreation. The designations would be similar to the process that BLM carried out in Southern California to establish the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, or DRECP. Additionally, the bill would direct the federal government to distribute the revenues from wind and solar projects to the states and counties in which federal lands development takes place, as well as to federal land management agencies to assist with permitting. 
Revenues would also be sent to a new fund to support conservation and recreation. Importantly, these new revenue distribution streams will give relevant stakeholders skin in the game when we responsibly develop clean energy projects. Further, due to the bipartisan efforts last year, the bill was significantly strengthened and improved. In fact, the wind and solar industries were happy to give us their endorsement for the first time ever. Thanks to these improvements, the bill was passed through the House twice and several new additions to the bill were finally signed into law. One of these provisions establishes a Renewable Energy Coordination Office at the Department of the Interior. Unfortunately, this office was disbanded under the previous administration, which often ignored the need to expeditiously and thoroughly review proposed renewable energy projects for public lands. I'm hopeful that with this new office, the Biden administration will be able to reduce permitting delays while still fully evaluating each project. Secondly, we were able to set a national goal to permit at least 25 gigawatts of wind, solar, and geothermal projects on our federal lands by 2025. And lastly, we gave the Bureau of Land Management the authority to modify acreage rental rates and capacity fees if existing rates exceed fair market value or are not competitive with other land. This provision is similar to the agency's authorities that govern fossil fuel development. As the department reviews its ex existing renewable energy policies, I've strongly encouraged the Bureau of Land Management to exercise this authority, and I will continue to do so. While our development on public lands needs to be smart, it also needs to be feasible in the existing market. Last year's progress was only a first step. The Public Land Renewable Energy Act of 2021 includes a number of updates and improvements to reflect continued feedback we've received. In particular, I'd highlight that we exempted the DRECP from review until 2030 to recognize the collaborative process that went into its creation and to ensure BLM directs its resources to areas that have not yet been reviewed. Mr. Gosar included all of these same updates and improvements in his version of the legislation. So I'm pleased that H.R. 3326, in fact, is bipartisan legislation. And I hope to add Republican co-sponsors in the days and weeks ahead. I'm proud of the bill we have today, and I look forward to moving it through the legislative process. With that, I'll turn to questions. Ms. Culver, as I mentioned, I believe the administration must make sure that smart renewable energy development on public lands is cost competitive so we can meet President Biden's clean energy goals. I've heard from some renewable developers that the cost of developing on public lands often doesn't reflect fair market value. What action is the Bureau of Land Management taking to address the high cost of rents and fees for wind and solar projects on our public lands? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, our regulations currently provide for adjustments due to hardship that may be imposed. In addition, the Ener Energy Act of 2020 gave us new authority to look at fair market value, um, whether or not the amount of fees are competitive, and in addition, a broader authority to look at adjustments that might be needed to promote the greatest use of our wind and solar resources. We're looking at that and including some of this authority through an ongoing uh, formal rulemaking, but also looking at opportunities to apply that case by case and that interim policy that might address it now. Well, thank you much, much, Ms. Culver. And I am out of time, but again, I want to reiterate my only goal is to get this bill signed into law. And uh, all are invited to co-sponsor this legislation after it's introduced. And with that, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Representative Levin. Uh, is uh, Representative Westerman here? If not, is Representative, I know he said that he'll be in and out of the meeting is Representative Stauber here. If not, I would like, and we'll come back to Representative Stauber and and West and Westerman. If that, I'd like to recognize Representative Tiffany for five minutes of questions. You are, thank, thank, Representative Tiffany. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question for. Um, don't we have a witness on the line in regards to uh, uh, from Trout Unlimited? Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? I think so. That may be we're talking about the second panel. We have Trout Unlimited, Ormac Technologies, uh, EDF Renewable. Uh, we have other questions in the second panel. Right now, we just have uh, the uh, Deputy Director of BLM in the first panel. So. Okay, like to, be, you'll, you'll get an opportunity in the second panel to raise. And that. that would be Ms. Culver, correct? Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, Culver is the is the rep is the uh, 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 panelist, the only panelist in okay. for the first panel. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'll direct my question to Ms. Culver. Um, with, for example, the Solyndra project, which was done over a decade ago, there was documented that there were massive kills of, um, of especially birds, including endangered species. Um, how is that going to be managed here as you go forward when we see um, endangered species that um, are being killed in quite large numbers, wherever we see, especially wind, where we see both wind turbines as well as solar panels, like the Solyndra example. Thank you for the question. Um, the BLM uh, currently uses a competitive leasing rule through regulation that prioritizes placement of projects in the lowest conflict areas. So, area, so projects that have less conflicts will be handled more quickly and issued more permanent leases. In addition, our regulation requires plans for mitigation and monitoring. And I would also note that the industry has continued to improve its technology. So we are seeing improvements in how to avoid harm to species and the, new tech, the updated technology we're seeing for both wind and solar. Yes, my understanding that, I don't know if I have the terminology correct, but uh, there were birds that would fly through the Solyndra project and they would ignite with the intense heat that was coming off the solar panels and they'd call them flamers. And um, um, I sure hope that that's being considered here as we go forward. Also, um, I would just say that um, we also, um, I believe in adopting an all of the above approach in regards to creating energy. In fact, I'm formerly a dam tender on a water project here in Northern Wisconsin. And I saw the benefit of water power and I don't see that listed here as one of those green energies, but we certainly here in Northern Wisconsin, whether you're Republican or Democrat, we view those as green projects being able to create um, electricity via hydropower. But I look at um, also uh, the goal that we have is to reduce emissions. And we've been doing that over the last 20 plus years, especially with the addition of natural gas uh, or the increase in natural gas that's being used. used. We're one of the few countries in the world that has reduced our greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a great credit to um, both our country as well as the fossil fuel industry. The other thing that I've mentioned here is I sure hope that if we're going to change NEPA or the permitting process here, that we apply that equally because uh, we see NEPA projects that it takes 10 to 20 years to get uh, permitting done. And that's terribly unfortunate. And that sounds like that's one of the things that's gonna be addressed in this, um, in this hearing. I would just close by saying this in regards to the comments that Chairman Grijalva uh, shared at the start of this of why a Republican would not be included um, on this bill, which is really unfortunate. He said there should be consequences or something along those lines for January 6th. And um, I hope he harks back to 2017 when there were Democrats that objected to the election um, of November of 2016. There were Democrats that objected to the election of November of 2004 in 2005. And uh, if we're going to uh, take into account the riots that happened in the Capitol, and that definitely was a riot, and hopefully people are being prosecuted, and we know that they are. I hope we will also hold to account members like the, uh, the member from Los Angeles, California, that came to Minneapolis in my backyard. Um, I represent uh, the eastern suburbs of the Twin Cities in Wisconsin where she was basically encouraging people to riot. I hope while he uh, says he wants to hold people to account, he will hold people to account also in his own party that have been calling for riots in this country. If we're gonna do a full review of January 6th, then let's do a full review of what rioting has meant to people across the country. We, had, we voted on $2 billion to go for greater capital security. What my constituents said, I see you're taking care of the politicians out in Washington, D.C. How about the riots that are happening in Minneapolis, Madison, and Kenosha? Do you care about them? Mr. Chair, Mr. I yield back. Th thank you, Representative Tiffany. Chairman Grijalva, do you wish to... Uh... Uh, Speaking Thank you very minutes. much, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you. Uh, Ms. Culver, welcome back uh, to the committee. It's good to see you in the new role that you're in. And uh, am I on? I know uh, that you're doing a lot at the BLM to repair some of the wrongs of the past uh, four years. And uh, I certainly, and we all appreciate it. I uh, also want to especially thank you for the willingness that you uh, had to listen to all the various stakeholders as parts as part of the oil and gas uh, uh, review. Even you, our public land should be a part of a climate solution. So I look forward to seeing the results of that work. Turning to this specific legislation before us today, right now there is very little uh, utility scale renewable energy coming from public lands. It is in the single digits uh, percentage wise if you if you look at where our electricity comes from nationally. So my first question is, that, do you agree that there is still an enormous amount of uh, potential in low conflict areas for renewable energy on our public lands? Thank you, Chairman Grijalva. Um, yes, I do agree, as does the BLM. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, we've identified about 19 million acres of land with potential for solar energy, in addition to the 285,000 acres of solar energy zones and about 20 million acres with wind potential. The, um, what we're seeing in terms of the elevation of demand in off of public lands makes us think there will be an increased demand on public lands and we can accommodate them. Yeah, one, uh, Ms. Culver, one, one of the things that, that, uh, mm -hmm. that continues to, to be a problem and, and to some ex uh, extent haunts uh, many of uh, a lot of energy development on our public lands and that has to do with, uh, with the impacts before and after the fact. And so going into the necessary and important uh, expansion of uh, renewables on public lands, the, how, how is BLM gonna ensure that we don't repeat uh, that, that legacy with uh, renewable energy developers and uh, how are we gonna mitigate that? You know, as we're, um complying with the direction in the Energy Act of 2020 and the executive order and similar ideas are encompassed in Plurita to update our land use plans to identify areas that are the most appropriate for development as well as those that are not appropriate. In addition, we're looking at bonding to ensure that um, impacts to land can be remediated and reclaimed as well as again ensuring that we have good plans for mitigation and monitoring along the way. So we're looking at it from the very start of the process as to where projects should be cited in the first place and then how they're managed along the way. Yeah, if I if I may Ms. Carter just add one one point and it's not so much a question as it is a something to look at. I think also part of the part of the precedent I think that it needs to be set for all energy development, and that includes gas and oil on public lands, is, is the issue of disclosure and transparency. Uh, I think there are important aspects of it uh, in that, you know, the battles are always uh, on those two topics. And if people knew more and if, if decision makers knew more, perhaps uh, that would affect decision making too. So transparency and disclosure. Uh, something to look at, I would hope. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva, and thank you for raising the issue of transparency and disclosure. And I now recognize uh, Mr. Gosar for five minutes of questions. Welcome, Mr. Gosar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm honored that the committee is here today considering the Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act HR 330, better known as Parita, which I had sponsored since the 112th Congress. I have been honored to sponsor this legislation, and although we were successful in including a number of pieces of this bill into law last year, my bill before the committee today would finish that work. As mentioned, this bill would streamline land use to promote more renewable energy on federal lands. In addition, taxpayers also benefit as this legislation directs revenues to the Treasury for de deficit reduction. 
increasing access for sportsmen as well as ensuring counties and states receive adequate revenue for development impacting their communities is a no-brainer. It has been regrettable that what has, be, what has been an extremely bright, bought, broad bipartisan effort for several Congresses has now devolved into a ranked partisan power play by the Democratic majority. I began this Congress by being informed by the majority that the only way Perita would move in this Congress is if it was sponsored by a Democrat. After five Congresses and nearly a decade of leadership on this issue, I was, as you would expect, disappointed. However, knowing that the importance of the policy to my constituents and our nation, I reluctantly agreed to allow my colleague from California to lead the bill with my support. However, last week I was done, denied even the courtesy of being an original co-sponsor of the bill upon which I have worked for nearly a decade. I have done this successfully with numerous pieces of legislation with Democrats in the lead. The majority he has the power to act on the issues they choose to act on as a majority. However, I will not give up on the work I have championed for a decade because the Democrat majority can't set aside their partisanship, which is why I've introduced Purita again in the 170th Congress and will continue, as I have, for a decade. I work with all my colleagues in a bipartisan fashion to promote this important legislation. Now some questions. Ms. Co Ms. Culver, thank you for joining us today. And I recently had an important BLM correspondence for a constituent delayed far beyond the requested response period by BLM which I finally got a response late last week from. I hope you will effectively prioritize congressional correspondence, understanding that our questions come from the people we represent. But this hearing isn't about BLM correspondence, it's about renewable energy. Ms. Culver, we're learning more and more about the unacceptable forced labor conditions in China, which have been labeled by the US State Department as genocide. How can you assure us that the solar panels made from slave labor coming out of China, where this genocide is taking place as we speak, are never a part of the solar projects that are assembled on federal lands in the United States. Thank you, Congressman Gosar. And may I just say, we appreciate your uh, understanding and patience uh, with correspondence as we're trying to address very complicated issues, um, as you mentioned, and we'll do our best to continue paying attention to those in a timely manner. Um, in terms of the procurement of um, equipment, you know, we have terms in our, um, agreements to that we can use to ensure that um, materials are appropriately sourced. And, and I would also look to issues like the president's recent executive order on the critical minerals supply chain where we're going to, yes, look at supplies, but also look at um, environmental impacts and economic impacts and environmental justice. And that's part of our mandate as well here. So I just want to make sure you have, you actually have uh, terms in the lease that give you that oversight in regards to dictating where these uh, uh, solar panels are coming from, right? You know, I'd have to check for sure to look at the terms we're using right now. I'd be happy to do that and get back to you. I think that would be very important because the, with the slave labor coming from a genocidal society, there's no room for that. Now, do you believe that a, a viable and important renewable energy industry in the United States is dependent upon a complete chain of manufacturing? And what will you do will you be doing to ensure that every step of that supply chain is supported by federal lands to make a more electric future possible? Sorry, Reverend Gosar, I'm having a really hard time hearing you. Yeah, let me try, try it one more time. Thank you. Do you believe that a viable and important renewable energy industry in the United States is dependent on a complete supply chain of manufacturing? And what will you do to ensure that every step of that supply chain is supported by federal lands to make it more electric future possible, like mining uh, for rare earths, critical minerals, th those kind of things. Thank you for the question. You know, I, I'm um, right now testifying on our ability to support renewable energy development on public lands. We're committed to doing that. We're also evaluating a number of proposals for mining on public lands, including for critical minerals and ensuring that that's done responsibly as well. I thank the chairman and I yield back. I yield back, Alan. Representative Gosar, I now call I, upon or recognize Representative McCollum for five minutes of questions. Welcome to the. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, to um, my colleague, Mr. Gosar, when he was talking about uh, being uh, on bills or not on bills. 
um, when I was, uh, I had worked on a bill for about five years and it uh, became the genesis of Feed the Future. And in order to have a hearing on my bill, which I had worked on for five years, um, Chris Smith, who's a good friend and an ally on this issue, told me he'd have to reintroduce the bill. He was in the majority and I could go second. So um, to Mr. Gosart, it depends upon the member. It depends upon a whole lot of things. So I understand you're, I understand you expressing your feelings, but it's also happened to me. Um, Mr. Col uh, Ms. Culver, excuse me, thank you for joining us today. And before I get further into the topic, I wanna thank you and President Biden for the ongoing review of the federal oil and gas leases on our public lands. And just taking just a moment to pause and assess the viability is important in ensuring that the taxpayers are always getting the best deal, a fair deal, and that we are being good stewards um, with our public lands and we are practicing conservation for future generations. So thank you for that undertaking. Um, as we consider the expansion of uh, energy on our public lands, I want you to know I'm very supportive of the administration's goals. We want to ensure responsible, efficient and effective development of clean energy. So um, you might not know this, but I'm a longtime member of the House Appropriations, uh, including chair of the Interior Subcommittee. And uh, I know you're gonna need resources in Congress to meet those uh, goals. B BLM's gonna need staff and funding to review more permits. So my questions are kind of a little more budgetary if, if uh, and I thank the chair for giving me this opportunity to ask some budget questions along with so we can make bills like this be successful. Do you foresee the workload of BLM renewable energy staff changing over the co uh, coming years? Are you going to um, need more uh, jobs expanded in, in other words, certain roles? For example, are you gonna need more biologists to study wildlife impacts and NEPA permitting? So could you just tell me a little more about what you're gonna need with that? And then anything you want to share with this committee about the Renewable Energy Coordination Office? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, to start with, I think the Renewable Energy Coordination Offices are something we're starting on and are something where we are looking at um, the need for additional resources. And um, because as was mentioned before, they um, need to be reestablished and we are looking at establishing them in states across the West, both individual states and regionally. And that will require a significant amount of staffing. While we do have wonderful staff who've been continuing to work on renewable energy projects over the last few years, standing up these offices will require additional staffing. Um, so we would need to add, supplement who we have in place right now and build on that knowledge. And that will require experienced um, staff in processing renewable energy in particular in planning and realty, but also as you mentioned in biologists for impacts to wildlife and to water. And of course, for tribal consultation, the administration has ensured that we start most of our, you know, start our new planning efforts and our new initiatives with thorough tribal consultation at the beginning, but also we want to support that going forward. So that will also require additional resources to ensure we can continue that open communication. Mr. Chair, thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll see, see what we can do about the, the financial support as a committee works on making sure we have great laws that protect our environment. Thank you. Thank you, Representative McCollum. I agree. Is Representative Stauber back? Representative Stauber, you are recognized if you have returned. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Ms. Culver, it's good to see you again and thank you for joining us today. I have a question about a language change as a result of the technical assistance we received from the Bureau of Land Management. The, the original language in section four decided to, effort to establish new priority areas for wind and solar development within three years of enactment. In response to a request from BLM, the language was altered to require the BLM only to establish a quote process for creating priorities areas within three years. I am concerned that this bill will allow for further delays and undermine the bill's intent by handling with burdensome red tape. So why was this language change requested by your department and how soon could we expect the agency to establish new priority areas under the version of the bill we are considering today? 
Thank you for the question. I, I think the change was to reflect the fact that in order to update these areas, we would need to update the governing land use plans, which is a really important opportunity for us to look at changed conditions on the ground, new technology, but also to engage in consultation, to work with stakeholders to in, and provide for public engagement as well as environmental analysis. So the change was in, intended to give us that time. And we have set a three-year time period to complete that process. Um, thank you. And Mr. Chair, I just want to just uh, clarify something. Mr. Gosar simply wanted to be an original co-sponsor of this bill. He has conceded that Mr. Levin uh, can be the, uh, one of the originals as well. So I just want to make that clear. Um, Ms. Uh, Culver, when Mr. Gosar's Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act is signed into law, it will undoubt undoubtedly lead to an increase in permitting renewable projects. Would a wind project permitted on federal land under the bill in, in Arizona count towards the administration's 30 by 30 agenda? Um, right now, we're looking at permitting projects in accordance with the goal set out for us to permit 25 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2025. And in relation to the other um, efforts, the conserving and restoring America the Beautiful, I think we're in the process of evaluating what would be um, inventoried and counted toward that initiative right now. So right now you right now you couldn't commit that um, Representative Gosar's bill, the, um, the, the, a wind project permitted on federal lands under the bill in Arizona, you can't commit that that would count towards our administration's 30 by 30 agenda. Is that correct? It would definitely count toward achieving our 25 gigawatts of permitting by 2025 and how that would interact with the efforts to conserve 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. That's something that we um, recently committed to establishing an interagency panel to identify what would be inventoried and counted toward that effort. Thank you, uh, Ms. Culver. It was a long answer to no, but I, I uh, so it, my district has more snowmobile trails than any other in the country. Would a trail funded and maintained through the state in conjunction with a private snowmobile club be considered conserved under the administration's 30 by 30 framework? So in the report that was just issued, you know, we have committed to trying to build on local efforts and locally led conservation to achieve those national goals and to work with across landowners and land ownership and specifically to enter into federal state partnerships. So I think we would be looking at the impacts and the effects of that kind of um, recreation because the, as you, as you know, it sounds like you've read the report. Um, we're also looking at improving access to recreation. So again, Right now, we're setting up an interagency committee to help define what we would be counting toward that effort. Yeah, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Chair, how much time do I have left? Let me just quickly take a look. You have 30 seconds left. <laughs> if, uh, Ms. Culver, if you weren't aware, Northern Minnesota is home to 95% of our nickel, uh, nation's nickel, 88% of our initial, na nation's cobalt, more than one third are copper and further deposits of rare earth elements, platinum group elements, gold and otherwise. Meanwhile, we currently produce the taconite accounted for 80% of this country's steel making. Can you commit to sourcing your materials for your renewable energy projects domestically where we use high quality labor? You know, we're, we're looking at how to best um, effectuate the president's direction to look for good paying union jobs. And I think in terms of supply chain, we're looking at executive order that was issued as well. And um, as, as I responded before, I'd be happy to look into our authority on what we can require and oversee in terms of materials. Thank you, Ms. Culver. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Stalver. Next, I call upon uh, Representative Porter for five minutes of questions. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Culver, for generations, oil and gas and coal companies have had facilities in, in near Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities, and they have often assumed, sometimes correctly, 
that the federal government would be less vigorous in pursuing environmental justice for people of color in this country. And I'm hopeful that that is changing and encouraged by some of the steps the Biden administration is taking to promote environmental justice for everyone. Can you tell us the committee a little bit more about how BLM is working across its many responsibilities to protect communities of color and create a just and equitable energy future for all Americans? Thank you for the question. Um, you know, as part of the forum that we held in late March, we were, as part of our evaluation of the federal oil and gas programs, we did have a panel on um, specifically on environmental justice and received some really helpful insight and input on how we could better address that concern, including potentially establishing um, federal advisory committees. We're taking those recommendations and input seriously. And as you mentioned, the executive order 14008 also directs us to look at environmental justice. So we are looking at that as well. Um, we've included support for that in our budget. Um, you'll see that in our budget proposals, I think. And we're looking at different ways to reach out to a broad um, spectrum of people as we continue to evaluate our energy programs and in fact, all decisions that we make on public lands. Terrific. Um, I know you um, mentioned that the budget uh, will be prioritizing these things. I wanted to ask more specifically though about tribal engagement. Um, it's something that our committee um, has been talking about as well. Um, can you elaborate on what BLM is doing um, to engage and have outreach to native communities? Um, and, and how are you working across the entire bureau to make sure that these are meaningful conversations um, and not kind of after the fact, um, you know, hear your concerns, but it's all been decided situation. Thank you for that question. You know, when I, we started with consulting about consultation to get really important input on what we were doing right and wrong and how to improve the entire process. And we're now incorporating some of that feedback into everything we do going forward. At the Bureau of Land Management, we are prioritizing uh, tribal liaison positions, including one at the national level, so we can incorporate that into all we do. Um, recently, you know, we, we've been consulting officially on the review of the oil and gas program. We completed that. We're kicking off consultation this week in connection with um, the selections um, for Vietnam veterans in Alaska, as well as those public land orders. So it's really becoming the first step in all, all we do. And we've learned and taken input on having multiple days and multiple ways for um, establishing input. So it's not just a letter that's sent out and, and we you know wait and see if we get a response. We're doing um, you know a lot of virtual meetings and, and trying to use that technology, including phone lines to accommodate what people's technology availability might be. That's really encouraging to hear. And I think there, you know, there is some real potential here with greater comfort with virtual meetings and things like that to try to hear from people and um, appreciate your comment about learning how best to take input then in designing an input process that, that makes that happen. Um, could you describe any ways that you're aware of that the Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act could help achieve these goals in terms of you know, priority and, and things like that? Um, the, uh, I'm not sure you're, I'm sorry, the goals around consultation and environmental justice? Yes, yes. Okay, um, thanks just for clarifying. Um, sure, you know, I think part of the first steps we're going to be doing is looking to update um, current land use allocations for what's the correct priority areas as well as what areas should be excluded or in that middle variance lands. And by consulting as part of that, we'll have an opportunity to get a lot of input from um, tribes as to which places are we have designated correctly, what additional efforts might be needed, as well as to get their input on the best places for um, large scale um, renewable energy development. In addition, the um, fund that's established through Plurita would provide funding for um, projects that could be federal, state, or tribal to protect and conserve um, fish and wildlife habitats, streams, and for recreational access to federal land. So I think we have another opportunity there for really important engagement. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Porter. I, I don't believe there are any other Republican members wishing to ask any questions. If there are, please go forward now. 
Well, we'll come back to the Republican members. And next, I'd like to uh, call upon Representative Huffman. You are now recognized for five minutes of questions. Welcome. To thank you, Chairman Lowenthal. Thank you for this hearing. Uh, and let me also thank you for your ongoing commitment to strike a conciliatory, civil, and productive tone in this subcommittee, even in the face of uh, the unfortunate rhetoric and partisan posturing we continue to see. Um, you have been over backward to be gracious and bipartisan in ways that really stand in stark contrast to how our Republican friends operated when they were in the majority not long ago. Representative McCollum shared the experience she had on legislation that she had to surrender to a Republican colleague in order to get it passed. I had two such bills uh, that I had to give up to a Republican colleague, not because I had fomented a violent, deadly insurrection, but simply because I was a Democrat and I wasn't offered anything as magnanimous as Chairman Lowenthal's offer to hold a separate special hearing for our colleague from Arizona. So let's just stop pretending that Republicans are somehow victims of heavy handed partisanship in this committee or anywhere else. They are being treated far more respectfully than Democrats were treated by them not long ago. Let's focus on the substance of this hearing now. Ms. Culver, I find it refreshing to have an administration witness here to talk about renewable energy uh, that is part of a group that's seriously working to tackle the climate crisis. I think the careful approach this administration is taking with the ongoing oil and gas uh, leasing review uh, is a very important uh, step forward for our climate and our country. I would hope the administration takes the next necessary step that was made crystal clear by last week's emphatic message from the International Energy Agency, who warned us that if we're going to meet our planet-saving climate goals, we simply have to stop investing in new fossil fuel development. We have a binary choice before us, the continued livability of this planet and the fossil fuel industry's desire for profits, and that should not be a close call. We should have a permanent moratorium on new fossil fuel projects on public land. I have proposed legislation to do that. Keeping fossil fuels in the ground is a necessary part of our response to the climate crisis. Uh, another common sense solution though is expanding clean energy on public lands. And uh, on that subject, Ms. Culver, one of the core principles of this legislation we're considering is that we need to be smart from the start in our planning. Does BLM agree that this is the best approach for a uh, balanced renewable energy uh, development policy uh, so that we can make sure that we're considering all the different uses of our public lands? And could you, could you just talk a little bit more about why this is the right approach? Thank you for the question. And um, yes, the BLM has a, a long history of addressing complicated issues at a landscape level and to do that through landscape level planning. Um, to manage, you know, our multiple use mandate, which has a number of uses and priorities and to help us balance. And this kind of approach can really help us with that balancing as we look to identify the best places for development with the least conflict. And using that approach allows us to prioritize our resources, but also those of industry and to prioritize and approve projects that will have the least conflict and yield the most energy. Thank you. C could you discuss some of the existing incentives for companies to build their projects inside of designated priority areas? Sure. Um, you know, in the solar energy programmatic environmental impact statement, we started this process um, a number of years ago, back in 2012, to identify solar energy zones, which are now also called designated leasing areas. And we had a number of zones established then. They've been added um, in other states as well to expand. And in those zones, um, leasing and permitting can be established more rapidly, both because there's additional programmatic analysis and lower, con lower conflicts, but also um, regional mitigation plans that can be joined to address, to be applied to address impact. So that incentivizes it. In addition, in our leasing rule, if you're going forward in a priority area, designated leasing area, you're awarded a lease. If you're outside those areas, you're awarded a grant and an opportunity to compete for them. So those right. are the I was going to ask you, I was going to ask to clarify, these aren't the only places projects can go forward, right? I mean, there are opportunities to do projects elsewhere. There are just extra incentives in these priority areas. Is that right? 
Exactly. We, we've developed incentives to direct uh, development into the priority areas, but in other areas, you can still develop. You will just um, go through additional environmental review, and then you'll have an opportunity to get a right of way. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Huffman. Uh, Ranking Member Stauber, I do not believe there are any other Republicans who have not asked any questions for the first panel, that is. Mr. Chair, I do believe that's correct. Thank you, Mr. S Ranking Member Stauber. With that, then I will ask the final set of questions. And I'll, uh, I want to talk to uh, Ms. Culver. And I want to, before I start to ask any specific questions, I want to thank you for recently appearing before our Natural Resources Committee's briefing and listening session, where you gave us all on the committee the opportunity to provide direct feedback on the administration's ongoing uh, oil and gas leasing review. These were not easy questions that were given to you, and I wanna thank you for the extensive amount of work that the administration is doing to hear directly, not only from members of Congress, but from local communities impacted uh, by oil and gas. It's very refreshing to have that relationship with you and with BLM. You mentioned something as I start my questions before about the Energy Act of 2020. And as you recall, at the end of last year, this committee gave the BLM several new authorities to increase the pace of clean energy development on public lands in the Energy Act of 2020. Can, I know you've mentioned some of this, but can you provide us an update of the administration's efforts to carry out this law? Kind of give us, where are we today on carrying out that law? Thank you for the question. Yes, under the Energy Act of 2020, we were directed to create the Renewable Energy Coordination Offices to set a national goal for renewable energy and to work toward this goal of citing 25 gigawatts of onshore wind, solar, and geothermal um, no later than 2025. So we are working with the department to establish these renewable energy coordination offices now. Um, we've put together a proposal and are looking to fill positions um, for the program to carry out that mandate. And we're also in the process of developing a memorandum of understanding for interagency cooperation and coordination, which we feel will be necessary for citing these projects efficiently. We um, have also um, prioritized this short list of actions, including updating our programmatic environmental impact statements for um, solar energy, which as I mentioned was completed in 2012, but also for geothermal, which was completed in 2008 and wind energy, which was completed in 2005. So this will allow us to update, you know, priority areas similar to the approach set out in Florida as well. And will allow us to also evaluate opportunities to expedite permitting of projects and associated transmission on public land. So we are, we are diving in. Um, we're also looking at ways to use the new authority we were given to adjust rents both in an interim capacity and as part of an ongoing and expected rulemaking to address our rental process and leasing process more thoroughly. Thank you. Uh, my other question is, um, Ms. Culver, how do wind, solar, and geothermal energy on public lands fit into uh, President Biden's recently announced goal of cutting greenhouse gas pollution by at least 50% by 2030. You know, the president has identified, you know, climate change as one of the, you know, existential threats and challenges of our time. And responding to this threat happens to also offer us an opportunity to create the good paying union jobs and that the president has prioritized and spur technology, technological innovation while citing these projects, which will allow us to support our transition to clean renewable energy. So as a part of this goal, um, proposed renewable energy projects will create electricity while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We feel we can be an important part of achieving these goals. Thank you. And finally, uh, not just, I'm concerned, not just, although I am very concerned with our climate goals, but also our goals in terms of the administration's goals to build back 
better. And so how does expanding wind, solar, and geothermal on public lands fit into the administration's build back better? Well, again, as we're seeing the increase um, of the renewable energy um, development on public lands and the expansion of the renewable energy industry writ large, we expect that to translate into more and more good paying jobs, including for work on federal lands. And our goals and our commitments will help to drive that increase. And we also expect that you know these commitments, as well as those in the Energy Act of 2020 and the American Jobs Plan will help drive additional work through both construction, but also storage and, and research and develop research and development and a whole host of other priorities where we'll be creating new jobs. Well, I want to thank the witness for her valuable testimony and the members for their questions. This concludes the testimony and the questions for our first panel, Ms. Culver. But the members of this committee may have some additional questions for you, and we ask you to respond to those in writing. Uh, under committee rule 3.0, the members of this committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing. And the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. Ms. Cul Culver, again, thank you for your testimony. You are free to go. And we look forward to seeing you again in the subcommittee. We find it a real pleasure to have that relationship with the administration. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm now gonna introduce our second panel of witnesses. Verinda Singh is the Vice President of Regulatory and Legislative Affairs at EDF Renewables, uh, a company that develops and builds renewable energy projects. Kate Miller is Government Affairs Director at Trout Unlimited, a member-based conservation organization which is dedicated to restoring trout and salmon populations and their habitats. Paul Thompson is Vice President of Business Development at Ormat Technologies, Inc., which is a leading geothermal energy development company is also the chair of the Geothermal Rising Policy Committee and Industry, and Industry Trade Association. And finally, we have Dawn Rowe, third district supervisor in San Bernardino County, California. Welcome, another Californian. And I know you are appearing on behalf of the National Association of Counties. Let me remind the witnesses that uh, under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin and, you, and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members and witnesses joining remotely use quotes, the stage review, so they may pin the timer on their screen. Uh, after your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will also ask the panel to test, to the entire panel to testify before we begin the questioning of witnesses. The chair now recognizes Mr. Singh for five minutes. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Singh. Thank you, uh, Chairman Lowenthal and Ranking Member Stauber. Thank you for your invitation and your continued focus on promoting renewable energy on public lands. I am Varinder Singh, Vice President of Regulatory and Legislative Affairs for EDF Renewables, one of the nation's largest in independent producers of solar and wind power. On behalf of our company, I want to express our sincere appreciation for the hard work and vision of this committee and its staff, Department of Interior Leadership, including Deputy Director Culver, the staff at the Bureau of Land Management and the many communities we work in, are working together on this more essential than ever mission to make a concerted effort to meaningfully address the unfolding harm of climate change. We are committed to the responsible development of renewable energy and federal lands with full respect and 
to care, protect our natural resources, and investing in healthy communities of all kinds. Our proved ability to build projects requires an ethic of respect that, that we are committed to as we continue to work with you on advancing these important issues. Headquartered in San Diego with employees and offices throughout the United States, EDF Renewables builds and maintains wind, solar storage, and EV charging projects across the U.S. We've developed over 20 gigawatts of projects in North America and operate and maintain over 13 gigawatts. I want to give a couple of several examples, at least two here, of projects and their economic development benefits to give you some anecdotal evidence of the value of renewables uh, to communities. Our Palin and Desert Harbor Harvest solar and, uh, storage projects in Riverside, California, employed a peak of 900 on-site workers last year in partnership with four different unions. The project is contracted to supply low-cost and clean power to a variety of customers, including Southern California Edison, Marin Clean Energy, and others. Second, we are proud to be a guest and partner of the Moapa Band of Paiutes in Southern Nevada, on whose land we will be building three projects coupling solar plus flexible batteries. The combined projects will pay over $115 million in rent and local government revenues, including tribal employment right ordinance payments and payments in local taxes. We, are, we thank the tribe the Moapa tribe for their vision, and we thank the Bureau of Indian Affairs for their timeless, timeliness and efficiency in project permitting. On the subject of this hearing, we greatly appreciate the timing of this hearing and the, and the legislation of the uh, 25 by 25 goal in the 2020 Energy Act. Based on the Biden administration's climate goals, we estimate, based on studies, that roughly 60,000 megawatts per year of new renewables will need to be deployed over the next decade. We do contrast that figure with the fact that federal lands today host, in terms of wind and solar, I'll let my geothermal colleagues speak to geothermal, but for wind and solar, federal lands today host just under 4,000 megawatts total, or just 7% of the projected annual need. We clearly need to do more to make federal lands relevant to our clean energy future. We provide several thoughts on ways to achieve a lot of these are in our written, all these are in our written testimony. I'll quickly go over some of them. First, we recommend that the Department of Interior inventory current projects in the permitting process to understand the potential to be built by 2025. This will require internal expertise on project development and electricity markets beyond the traditional expertise of the Department of Interior. We recommend that BLM revise past wind and solar programmatic environmental impact statements due to the advancement of technology and the change in the market overall. And yet we do not advise sole reliance on landscape planning for renewables deployment. We recommend avoiding, as we say, over prioritizing priority areas to the detriment of variance areas. And accordingly, we applaud HR 3326 extension on directing the timely processing of renewable energy applications on variance areas in conjunction, in parallel with established new landscape plans and not to the exclusion of. We ask for the continued permitting of existing applications while implementing new program programmatic in initiatives. And then we also recommend against the sole reliance on competitive leasing in lieu of the traditional right of way process. In certain instances and for certain sites, the scarcity, for example, of available transmission precludes real com competition for given sites. And pursuing competitive leasing in lieu of the right-of-way process can add years to the overall permitting process and the creation of new renewable generation. I finally raised the issue of cost. We do strongly encourage BLM to revisit rental, rental rate methodologies, adjust rents and fees where they exceed fair market value as in Southern California, revisit the rationale of the capacity fee when renewables are not exhaustible, and open, uh, be open to requests by right-of-way grantees to base rent on site-specific appraisals. Thank you for your time and efforts on this important issue. Federal lands must be an important part of our clean energy future. By understanding what is possible now, by investing in new resources such as the Renewable Energy Coordination Offices, and by addressing issues related to location, timelines, and cost, we can deliver clean energy at a low cost with strong economic benefits, all while addressing the imperative of climate change. 
I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Singh. And now the chair recognizes Ms. Miller for five minutes of testimony. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Chairman Lowenthal. Uh, can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, Chairman you Lowenthal, hear me? ranking member. Yes. Thanks. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, uh, Chairman Lowenthal, ranking member Stauber, and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of the Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act. And thank you for holding this hearing to consider the important topic of expanding clean energy on public lands. My name is Kate Miller, and I am the Director of Government Affairs for Trout Unlimited. Trout Unlimited is a membership-based organization with more than 300,000 members and supporters organized into local chapters and state councils across the country, collectively aligned behind the mission of protecting and restoring cold water fisheries and their habitats. Trout Unlimited strongly supports this legislation which has been introduced in some form in every Congress since 2011, each time with broad and bipartisan support. A version of this legislation passed the House just last Congress, and as previously noted, several components were included in the end of year energy package, which was signed into law as the Energy Act of 2020. While we were pleased to see that those provisions, those provisions advanced, we were disappointed that the heart of the bill was left behind. The bill before the committee today would carry those key provisions forward, including provisions to update the upfront planning process for solar, wind, and geothermal, and critically, the revenue sharing program that will strategically direct royalty revenue from these projects into local communities, fish and wildlife resources, and support efficient permitting. Public lands contain some of the most valuable trout and salmon habitat in the nation. In most Western states, public lands comprise more than 70% of the available habitat for native trout and representing the, the vast majority of remaining strongholds for cold water species. Millions of individuals, including Trout Unlimited members, visit public lands each year to hunt, fish, or recreate. These activities are part of an estimated $500 billion outdoor recreation economy. Uh, public lands clearly are essential for fish and wildlife habitat, outdoor recreation, and we recognize in some areas, these lands also represent good opportunity for development of wind, solar, and geothermal energy. The demand for more renewable energy to combat the increasingly severe impacts from climate change is growing, and we recognize the important role that federal lands could play in this growth. We also know that decisions about how and where development occurs can have long-term implications for fish and wildlife. If we are to unlock the potential for renewable development on public lands, we need to get that balance right. We believe that uh, Plurida contains the key elements to meet this needed balance. First, the bill adopts a look before you leap approach to siting and developing projects by bringing stakeholders together to proactively identify and prioritize area with high energy potential and lower impacts to fish and wildlife values. Second, the bill establishes a revenue sharing model that will support agency engagement, provide sustained revenues to local counties and states, and will support recreational access and conservation of fish and wildlife values. No development is without impact, and even the best siting decisions, uh, utility scale of wind and solar will occupy large chunks of land for long periods of time, and some impacts will be unavoidable. The revenue sharing model of this bill would establish a conservation fund to support and sustain recreational access and to help ensure that we stay ahead of the conservation and restoration needs of fish and wildlife and water in places impacted by these developments. In addition to the conservation fund, the revenue sharing model will provide a sustained revenue stream to the counties and states where these projects are cited, typically in rural communities with large areas of federal public land. This is important to support local planning and to help ensure that the counties and adjacent communities are supported as partners in the siting development and associated services connected with these developments. Finally, Florida will also direct revenues to support the permit processing. Uh, strong funding for our federal resource management agencies is critical. It's critical to ensure that these agencies can properly manage lands and programs for the benefit of current and future generations. In all of these ways, Florida will support increased collaboration and reduced conflict focusing the permitting process on the best possible areas and distributing revenues to invest in local communities, efficient permitting, and the conservation of healthy fish and wildlife habitat. 
For years, this legislation has enjoyed the support of hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation groups, renewable energy trade associations, the National Association of Counties, and many, many others, both on and off Capitol Hill. We thank the committee again for considering this legislation, and we stand ready to work with you all to advance this bill into law. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Ms. Miller. The chair will now recognize Mr. Thompson for five minutes of questions. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking, May Ranking Member Stauber, and all the committee members of the House Natural Resources Committee and Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources for having this hearing. It's great to be back and discussing Florida once again. I'll make a few brief remarks and then make myself available for questions. By way of introduction, ORMAT was founded in 1965. It's headquartered in Reno, Nevada, and today we own and operate over 1,000 megawatts of geothermal, storage, solar PV, and recovered energy generation. We also manufacture equipment right here in Reno, Nevada, and we are responsible for about two additional gigawatts of generation around the world utilizing ORMAT equipment. We have 1,400 employees, and maybe most importantly, is we avoid the generation of about 4.5 million tons of CO2 per year. We operate facilities in six countries, the United States, Kenya, Guatemala, Indonesia, Honduras, and Guadalupe. And we have 12 operating projects on BLM land. And maybe most important for this hearing is that we develop most of our projects in the West on leased lands. We have 587 megawatts of geothermal facilities utilizing 252,000 acres under lease in California, Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah. And we have 100,000 acres of BLM land under lease that we are currently developing projects on. In 2020, ORMAT paid approximately $3 million in royalties and about $863,000 in rentals to the Bureau of Land Management. And we have been a long supporter of this Plurita bill because geothermal has historically really paid the royalties that are uh, highlighted in this bill with about 50% of our uh, royalties going to the state, 25% to the county in which the project is developed and 25% to the BLM. And we are seeing all of this today with the development of state-of-the-art zero emission binary technology. For this committee, if you haven't seen a geothermal power plant in the next, in the in the last decade, I would encourage you to come out and tour one of our facilities. Um, you could not be, you would not be able to recognize the technology improvements that have occurred in the last decade. I'm also here on behalf of Geothermal Rising, and Geothermal Rising is formerly known as the Geothermal Resource Council, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It was founded in 1972 and is headquartered in Sacramento, California. It is the largest direct membership professional trade association serving the geothermal industry and has over 1,200 members representing a board of diverse demographics across the geothermal community. We applaud the, the reintroduction of HR 3326, the Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act, because it will establish these priority areas that you've heard about today. These preferred locations, prioritizing permit applications for priority review are critical. And the timing couldn't be better for this bill because we are seeing in the geothermal market today a huge increase in power purchase agreements. The market is demanding resources that are firmly flexible, that have zero emissions, and we are seeing more and more geothermal contracted, which means we need to develop more and more of these projects on our federal lands. The value for geothermal is rising. The capacity that it can provide has been proven. Congress has recognized that it's critical to combat climate change with its zero emission profile, and it has a footprint 22 times smaller than other technologies. Most recently, NREL's GeoVision report in conjunction with the DOE highlighted that if we can just reduce the time it takes to develop a project from eight years to four years, we will more than double the geothermal development over the business as usual case by 2050. This will result in an additional 6.5 gigawatts of geothermal development. I'm also thrilled to tell you that last Friday, ORMAT received two records of decisions for two additional geothermal projects on federal lands in Nevada. 
Uh, Mark Hall and Kathleen Rayberg out of the Winnemucca office worked tirelessly along with the BLM State Director John Raby to permit these projects in under two years. Their work will immediately start the exploration and construction on about 100 megawatts of permitted geothermal projects in the state of Nevada. These projects will create profound jobs within tribal and low income communities throughout the West. Geothermal can prove can, has proven that it can strengthen economies uh, even during this uh, most recent COVID-19. The economic and fiscal impacts associated with 6.5 gigawatts of new and existing geothermal is stunning. These projects are estimated to generate a total economic impact of $148 billion. The construction phase is estimated to generate $29 billion in economic activity, and the projects will create approximately 100,000 jobs with high paying wages and salaries. Most importantly, all of this development would avoid about 30 million metric tons of CO2 annually. We are excited to support HR 3326. We think prioritizing this permitting uh, will have a huge, pay huge dividends. Excited to be back here again. And, and if you've ever heard me testify before, I just can't uh, explain how important the permitting is, streamlining it, and this bill. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to answering any questions the committee has. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. The chair now recognizes Ms. Rowe for five minutes of testimony. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HR 3326, the Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act, known as Florida. My name is Don Rao, and I am the San Bernardino County California Supervisor for the 3rd District. I am here on behalf of myself and the National Association of Counties known as NACO. In the spirit of Florida and its strong bipartisan tradition, we thank Congressman Levin for supporting this bill and Congressman Gosar for his leadership on the issue over the years and for sponsoring identical legislation. San Bernardino County is over 20,000 square miles in area and over 80% of that land is federally owned. While federal lands come with unique opportunities, they also add pressure to our local infrastructure and services, including roads, bridges, emergency search and rescue, and public health. We must provide these services to every resident and visitor, even though less than 20% of our land is taxable. I believe that Florida deserves consideration by this Congress because it encourages responsible, renewable energy development. It provides equitable re revenue sharing, with impacted counties, and it takes a balanced approach to renewable energy development and conservation. For many renewable projects on public land, the single greatest barrier to development is the protracted permitting process that we just heard about. Currently, only about 5% of our nation's renewable energy scale capacity comes from sources on public lands because of the federal red tape. The Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, or DRECP, was adopted in 2016 and is designed to streamline renewable energy development on 22 million acres of federal land, half of which is located in my county. Florida would further complement the DRECP. Additionally, San Bernardino County has more than two dozen solar projects completed or in the pipeline. The bill's streamlining provision will lead to faster turnarounds in federal permitting which will also help meet the president's goal of 100% carbon-free power generation by 2035. Although renewable energy projects create jobs and clean energy, counties still must provide essential services to support the facilities. Nationwide, counties build and maintain 44% of our roads and 39% of our bridges, and we invest hundreds of millions of dollars annually to provide services on federal land. Especially in Western counties, those who could benefit most from Florida the cost of providing these services is significant. Florida strikes a careful balance, encouraging renewable development and sharing revenues with counties to offset negative impacts, as is already the case with forms of resource development on public lands. Florida would establish a distribution formula where 25% of the renewable development revenue would be shared with impacted counties. Revenue sharing for renewables is not a new concept. As those on private lands already share revenues with counties. In my county, we charge a per acre fee to offset the cost of public services, and we negotiate for the equipment point of sale to be in the county to capture the sales tax revenue. A university study found that Florida, if it were enacted, in San Bernardino County, we would receive 1.2 million in royalty payments from renewable energy development on public lands. 
Statewide, California counties would receive 8.2 million, according to the study, which would only grow as new projects come online. Florida would ensure that PILT payments are supplemented and not replaced as a result of this legislation. This provision is crucial to counties with significant amounts of public land. Finally, renewable projects can negatively impact the landscape itself. Here again, Plurita strikes a careful balance by depositing 25% of the revenues generated in a fund for fish and wildlife habitat restoration. The fund will be used to enhance, enhance outdoor recreational opportunities in communities near renewable sites. Responsible development of domestic renewable energy will create jobs grow, and grow local economies. And as we move towards a more balanced domestic energy portfolio, we commit to working with the federal government as equal partners in supporting renewable development. On behalf of San Bernardino County and NACO, we thank Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, and the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify. Florida will help us achieve our collective economic, energy, and environmental health goals. Counties encourage the swift passage of this measure, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Rowe, for that testimony. Now the committee, uh, the chair is going to recognize members of the committee for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. And so I'm going to call on first Representative Levin for five minutes of questions. Welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Singh, it's great to see you uh, again. Uh, I so appreciate your continued engagement on Florida's uh, particularly since EDF uh, Renewables North America is headquartered in San Diego. Uh, question for you, what are the unique challenges in your experience of working on public lands? And do you agree that Florida takes a step in the right direction to address these issues? Uh, thank you, Congressman Levin, and uh, thank you for your question. Yes, as we provide our written testimony, I would you know, genericize the issues into several broad categories. One is location, the second is time, and the third is cost. On the issue of location, we would have to say that the results of both the wind and solar PISs did not take into sufficient account of the electrical grid, including proximity to transmission. The sites that were prioritized were often not very viable. Uh, and therefore, that's why we stress the importance of variance areas. Central landscape planning is a worthwhile effort, but sole reliance on that to get everything just right would be a mistake and would forego the entrepreneur entrepreneurial nature and expertise of the industry in finding equally good sites that are compatible with natural resource conservation and are viable relative to the electric grid. So location is very important. The second is time. It takes a long time to permit on federal lands. It takes years to do landscape planning and even then tearing off of the NEPA from the landscape planning still at results in multi-year development timelines. And then finally, the issue of cost, as I referenced, unfortunately, our, we had to provide filings showing that the, the, the rents and fee combinations for lands in Southern California were many times higher than uh, the fair market value we would estimate for private lands. So those are three issues that uh, both the 2020 Energy Act and current provisions in, in your legislation address. Uh, and we greatly appreciate it because legislation hits on all of those areas in some way. Thank you for that. Uh, another a question for you. I know last year the Energy Act included language that gives the Bureau of Land Management the authority to adjust acreage rental rates and capacity fees to ensure they don't exceed fair market value. How important is it that the Department of the Interior uses the new authorities that we enacted into law uh, at the end of last year? Uh, incredibly important. Uh, it is a primary, you know, those three categories provided are equal in their impact. If you don't solve for any one of them, then overall deployment will suffer tremendously. And, and cost is a major one. As I did mention, uh, uh, Congressman Levin, in, almost in your backyard, uh, the, the rental and fee structure is uh, many times higher than what we would have to pay on private lands. That, that drives development away. And without solving for that, uh, deployment will not, will not take effect. Got it. Appreciate that, uh, Mr. Singh. 
Uh, Ms. Miller, I wanted to uh, turn to you. I know you support this bill because of the conservation and recreation provisions it includes. And I think we all believe that recreation and renewable energy development can and should coexist. Uh, do you support the Bureau of Land Management working to identify and designate more public lands across the West as priority areas for clean energy projects? Yes, thank you for the question, Congressman Levin. Um, we do support the agencies uh, collaborating with the public, um, with the local governments and affected stakeholders to evaluate priority areas and determine whether changes need to be made. Um, you know, I think this process could result in more areas being identified or changes to the areas currently identified as priorities. But the important part is getting together early to identify the best areas for development with the lowest impact to other values. So well, we thank you so much. And, and Mr. Chairman, I would just close again by saying we've got to get this one signed into law. Uh, this is the future. The Biden administration has committed to that future and uh, our public lands can and sh uh, should be a part of uh, that effort to meet our 100% carbon pollution free power goals by 2035. So. Uh, we are excited, and uh, I'll yield back with that, and uh, thank you again for this hearing. Uh, thank you, Representative Levin. I now call upon and recognize uh, Ranking Member Stauber for five minutes of questions. Ranking Member Stauber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Supervisor Rao, thank you for joining us today. As a former St. Louis County, Minnesota commissioner, I recognize the challenges that federal lands can create to county revenues. Can you elaborate on the challenges associated with having associated with having significant amounts of federal land in your county's borders and how the revenue sharing provisions of this bill will help alleviate these challenges? Thank you, sir. I can certainly try. So the issues that are arising out of federal lands in counties are getting so bad that we just recently had to set aside $10.4 million of our discretionary general fund for this upcoming budget to address the concerns. And I'll give you two quick examples. We have tourists that are flocking to Joshua Tree National Park to enjoy camping in the outdoors. But there are so few campsites within the park that the tourists are now overflowing into our county desert areas and illegally camping on grounds out there. And that is creating illegal campfires. We have trash and dumping all over that are impacting our local residents. And that is a concern that the county is having to deal with. Another example is how Southern Californians are flocking to our local mountains to enjoy snow play in the winter, and that takes place on federal uh, forest service land. So they park illegally, and they too leave tons and tons of broken sleds and trash behind for the counties to clean up. So the royalties from, from Plurita would help the county offset some of those negative impacts from the federal lands that we all enjoy. Thank you, uh, uh, Supervisor Rao. Thank uh, you. Mr. Thompson. Thank you for joining us today as well. This bill represents a good first step towards streamlining the process for onshore renewable development on federal lands. But there are still significant challenges that need to be ironed out. In previous Congresses, the Republicans on this committee have supported a categor categorical exclusion for geothermal testing. Can you discuss additional federal permitting reforms needed to advance geothermal energy on our federal lands? for the question. Um, categorical, well, let me take a step back. Geothermal has to permit things twice. So it has to permit the subsurface research to drill the wells and find the geothermal reservoir. And then it has to permit a utilization permit for the power plant. And so if you hear from uh, my friend at EDF, the, the perils of permitting, multiply that by two for geothermal. A categorical exclusion, which is used um, uh, throughout the country would allow us to go look for that geothermal re reservoir, test it, and determine if we want to start the permitting process. So when it comes to raising capital and developing projects, this would rapidly expedite the pro process. There is kind of a categorical exclusion in statute today, um, but it's very, uh, it, it's up to the opinion of the BLM. And so in some places, the BLM says, yes, we'll grant you a categorical exclusion. Some places they don't. And so we've looked for tweaks to that, changing some of the verbiage, and would greatly encourage this committee to again evaluate deploying a categorical exclusion. So geothermal developers can go find this resource, 
quickly, prove that it's there with very non-intrusive uh, drilling techniques that can be um, you know, recaptured, then go get the funding to look to drill large diameter wells to develop these projects moving forward. Uh, additionally, I think transparency and tracking of the geothermal process is key. You heard me talk about some of our recent successes in permitting in, in the state of Nevada, which is very advanced in geothermal permitting. Other states um, aren't as familiar with geothermal. And so sharing those techniques to streamline the permitting process and then also being aware where sometimes this process has taken six to eight years is going to be key to getting that 6.5 gigawatts of geothermal online. And I just want to jump back to the previous question, if I can. You know, what's interesting is the counties in Nevada and California where we operate, you know, geothermal pays the royalties to the local county and the state. And it's gone to all of these issues you've heard of and expanding this to the other technologies like Florida levels the playing field. And I think will create just the streamlined permitting moving forward. Thank you very much. Mr. Singh, thank you for joining us today. And I noticed you have several projects in Minnesota, either in or very near my district. Did you source, or where did you source those materials for the solar panels? Uh, uh, Ranking Member Stauber, I will have to get back with you on that. It depends on the projects. So I don't have comprehensive uh, inventory of where panels come from for each of our projects. Would you agree that some or the vast majority of solar panels don't come from, from within the United States and the sourcing of them? Uh, that would be correct today, yes. Okay. All right, Mr. Uh, Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Stauber, Ranking Member Stauber. I now would like to see is um, Representative Porter here? Representative Porter, going once, twice. We'll come back to you if you return. Now I'd like to call upon Representative McCollum for five minutes of, of questions. Representative McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I thought it was an interesting um, a point and counterpoint that um, Mr. Stauber had with Ms. Miller because uh, of uh, overflow and then the expense on counties or states or sometimes municipalities and park systems. And that is something that I am very glad that we're looking at. I was at Joshua Tree and I know BLM had even some uh, area next to it uh, that, that was underdeveloped uh, for uh, what it could, what it could be used for. I, I'm pretty sure it was BLM land. It was, it was pre COVID that I was there and I don't have my notes in front of me. Um, so, I would like to just take a take a second, and maybe have you talk about um, sometimes on a public lands we can have competition for how that they're going to be used, whether it be Forest Service, Park Service, or, or BLM. Um, and renewable energy is something that needs to be part of our future if we're going to uh, be not only energy independent, but um, as the U.S. Department of Defense uh, sees climate change as a uh, strategic. Uh, detriment uh, to our ability to, um, you know, be a strong, be a strong nation and, and live in a peaceful world. So you could just tell me a little bit about, uh, stress again, some of the things in this legislation that uh, you think will allow renewable energy to move forward and not conf uh, conflict or compete with uh, other activities on public lands. Thank you. I, I believe the, the question was directed to me. Is that correct? This is Dawn with San Bernardino County. Thank you. Um, in our county, we work collaboratively, collaboratively with a lot of competing interests for usage on public lands, whether that is outdoor recreation, conservation, um, you know, utility development. And we have a fantastic um, relationship with all of our partners to try to balance those needs, both at the federal, the state, and the local level. And I think that citing the renewable energy developments um, on the federal land relieves the burden of the county so that we can help focus on some of our other areas where we need to, to focus our limited resources. And so with our collaboration, I, I would think that this bill will tremendously help um, the limits that we have within the county. And we will continue to partner collaboratively with all those interested in sharing the public lands. 
Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miller, from your point of view. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. I, I do believe that Clarita will help um, take the right approach to balancing the multiple interests in public land use and public land management. Um, I think the, the key component here is uh, really taking a um, early look uh, and bringing the right folks together to um, evaluate where, where are the best places and how could we best use these lands on the landscape scale. So making sure that we're focusing renewable energy development in areas that have lower risk of conflict um, and bringing states and counties in as partners from the start, I think will really, really help to make sure that we're making the right decisions about how to use these lands. Thank you. And the and the other thing, when it when it comes to payment in lieu of taxes for federal lands, that used to be something, um, Mr. Chair, that was uh, in the in, in the Ways and Means Committee, and so it was something that was was uh, counted on, uh, knew was going to be deliverable, and there was no question about it. In other words, it was mandated, and. Uh, in some of the tax bills and reforms that have happened in the past, now they put it in the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee where it is discretionary. That is not fair to the counties. It's not fair to the counties in Minnesota or fair to the counties any place in, in this country. So I would like to uh, see that, that get returned back to the Ways and Means Committee and be mandatory spending. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative McCollum. You, and thank you for that last point about what we might work together on. Uh, I'd now like to call on Representative Gosar. Representative Gosar, five minutes of, of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the general lady from Minnesota for making that point because uh, that was a promise. And, and trust uh, with the federal government comes with promises kept. So thank you so very, very much. Uh, it, it's a meager uh, aspect that the appeal gives. Um, but we should give it as mandatory spending. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I got a couple of questions for the full panel. So uh, I would like everybody that down the road just to uh, acknowledge this. Did your air organization support the Representative Gosar Public Lands Renewable Energy Development Act, HR 6154 and the 112th Congress? Panel. Congressman, I'll start. This is Supervisor Rao. Yes, we did. We we support both the legislation in the past, the legislation that you currently have introduced, as well as this legislation. Thank you. How about you, Ms. Miller? Same. Fabulous. Fabulous. Uh, so did you uh, did your organization support the Gosar Florida Bill HR 596 in the 113th Congress? Supervisor? I believe we did. It was a prior to my time, but yes, sir, I believe so. Yes. How about you, Ms. Miller? Yes, Congressman, we've supported this bill all, all along its history. Thank you. Uh, uh, anybody else? I don't have everybody's name on right in front of me. Congressman Gosar, this is Paul Thompson with Ormat Technologies. And yes. as I said in my opening statement, yes, we have been supportive from for supportive of Florida from the beginning. Yeah, so I guess we're going to go down the road. Uh, did you support the Florida Bill 2663 in the 114th Congress? Yes, sir. Supervisor? I believe so. Yep. Ms. Thompson? Yep, thank you. How about uh, in the 115th Congress, uh, H.R. 825? Yes. My understanding is that San Bernardino County and NACO have been supportive of this legislation. Thank you. How about H.R. 3794 and the 116th Congress? Yes. Affirmative, uh, sir. I, have, I appreciate that. And I want to com uh, uh, compliment all of you because you were critical into building this bill as it, uh, it stands. Uh, your advice, your uh, critiques, your professionalism and your uh, uh, support from the people really uh, uh, made this ha actually happen. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you can see, uh, for decades, these groups have been supporting a bipartisan work. I have always tried to work in a bipartisan fashion. 
In fact, last year, just to give you another example, one of my uh, telltale signs of uh, the Competitive Health, uh, Competitive Health uh, Insurance Act, where um, uh, we got rid of the Sherman and Clayton antitrust uh, monopoly uh, rule, Peter DeFazio was the lead on that. And I was the one that pushed it through the Senate in the waning hours. So I, I'm very uh, uh, versed in uh, the, getting the power to get things done. I find it insulting. And, and I, 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 I had heard Ms. McCullough's comment uh, about Chris Smith, but I'm sure if I'm, I might be mistaken that Ms. Uh, McCullough was uh, uh, an original co-sponsor
that, as was noted just uh, uh, yesterday, today or on Friday by the head of the California Independent System Operator, California is having a vast fleet of those hybrids coming online. Our projects on federal lands were some of the first. You're going to see a lot more. That's providing a lot more flexibility to the overall wind and solar fleet. So we look forward to providing that kind of uh, capabilities to the grid. Thank you. That was very, very helpful, Mr. Singh. I'm going to ask Ms. Miller a question. Uh, you know, we're talking about a transition now uh, from uh, uh, fossil fuel towards more renewable and ultimately kind of looking at a meeting the president's goals for renewable. I, I want to know more about the benefits to fish and wildlife habitat if we shifted away from fossil fuels and if we got the majority of our energy from clean energy resources like wind, solar, and geothermal. Can you tell us what the benefits might be uh, to fish and wildlife habitat if that's really became uh, if renewable energies became the predominant form of energy. Thank you for the question, Chairman Lowenthal. Um, yes, I, I think that um, hunters and anglers are, you know, on the front lines of witnessing the impacts of a changing climate on uh, both the species where we're out there uh, hunting and fishing and, and the habitats on which they depend um, I, I think it's it's clear that uh, transition to cleaner sources of energy is is one step uh, that is essential in in moving us to a uh, better future. I, I think the important part is that um, we make that transition in a thoughtful way. Uh, even renewable energy development can have impacts, uh, and it's imperative that we do the upfront planning to put them in the right places. Um, you need to look no further than the sort of legacy impacts of, of hydro development and impacts on rivers. I think it's really critical and Florida takes the right step to make sure that we uh, do the landscape level look first to develop, you know, to develop priority areas and identify where the right places for development are and then prioritize and incentivize ensuring development goes to those places. So I do think renewable energy development uh, is part of the solution. And I think that Florida uh, outlines a a smart smart pathway to um, develop those on on public lands in a way that uh, does not repeat some of the mistakes of the past. Thank you, and I'm going to quickly close with uh, Mr. Thompson. Beyond this legislation, what recommendations do you have for BLM that uh, we can how we can responsibly expand geothermal on public lands? Maybe in a brief kind of answer that, Mr. Thompson. Thank you very much, Chairman Lowenthal. Uh, appreciate the time to be here today. As, as we've highlighted in our comments, I think um, enhancing the categorical exclusion for geothermal is key. I think creating greater transparency to the permitting and sharing that permitting information on how to do this with other district offices uh, throughout the West is key. I also think that updating the um, uh, CADEXs and uh, PEISs that are in the Florida bill are key and being able to do uh, both the exploration and utilization development at the same time are just absolutely critical. And I would be remiss if I didn't build on the comments of Mr. Singh on renewables being uh, firmly flexible. The CPUC just announced that they want additional 1,000 megawatts of power like geothermal with an 85% capacity factor. Resources like geothermal, storage, working with solar and wind, create an incredibly firm ecosystem for, for energy projects. And we are seeing advanced states with renewable portfolio standards like Nevada and California be able to meet increasingly high renewable portfolio percentages, meaning they want to get 100% of their resources from renewables by bringing all these projects together. And that's the beauty of the Florida bill is that it looks at all of these renewable resources, recognizes all of their critical importance to working together um, and as my, my grandmother said, moderation in all things. So looking at all of these projects, uh, we can provide firm resources with zero carbon to the grid. We can create unparalleled jobs and create an economic impact that's absolutely stunning. Thank you for the time today. Thank you. And uh, I thank all the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses. 
Uh, we'll ask you to respond to these in, writ in, in writing, uh, members of the panel. Under committee rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing. And the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. I also wanna remind the witnesses that they're encouraged to participate in the witness diversity survey created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer to their hearing invitation materials for more or more further for further information. If there's no further business, without objection, this subcommittee stands adjourned.